Good morning. We start with general questions today and with question number one from Pauline McNeill. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on extending child fares to the age of 18 for all forms of public transport. Minister Hamza Youssef. The National Concessionary Travel Scheme for Young People already provides discount on bus and rail travel within Scotland for all young people living in Scotland aged between 16 to 18. Using the Young Scot Smart Card, the scheme offers a one-third discount off the adult single fare on any registered bus service in Scotland. It also offers one-third off most rail journeys in Scotland and a 50% discount on rail season tickets. Eligible island residents also receive vouchers for four free ferry journeys a year. In addition, the Scottish Government will introduce free, free bus travel to modern apprentices aged under 21 in 2018. We'll also be providing three months free bus travel for recipients of the jobs grant aged between 16 and 24 once this benefit comes into force. Polly McNeill. I thank the Minister for that comprehensive answer. The Minister will be aware that Naomi Eisenstadt, the Government's Advisor on Poverty, recently said that there's, there needs to be a bit more focus on the late teens age group between 14 and 19. Um, if you're age 16 or 17, you're four and a half times less likely to be in employment than the group between 18 and 21. The minimum wage is half, and if you're an apprentice, it's even less than that. It seems unfair, I think, for the independence of 16-year-olds that on your 16th birthday, you pay the full fare on all public transport. Now, notwithstanding what the Minister has said to the Chamber today about the various discount schemes available, in those discount schemes, they're either required to travel off-peak or spend more than £12 on those fares. I think it's time to focus on transport policy for that age group. I think it, it enhances their independence. And I think the government needs to go further if it wants to ensure that young people see that there's something in government policy for their age group. Minister. Uh, look, I know the constructive uh, approach that Paul O'Neill has taken with me thus far uh, on this issue. We're due to meet, in fact, uh, of course, uh, later today uh, on this issue. Uh, I would just reiterate that there are discount schemes there, a third off any registered bus service uh, if you're between age 16 to 18. Uh, that same third discount for rail passengers for most rail journeys. But I don't discount what she says at all. Uh, we're going through the process of the National Transport Strategy Review. I think looking at that potential inequality, uh, as she uh, describes it, uh, would be a wise move for us to take. I'm more than willing to work uh, closely with Polly McNeil. Uh, the Scottish Youth Parliament have also approached me uh, about this issue as well. Uh, of course, there are financial constraints. She understands those, but I'm willing to be as open-minded uh, to see what we can do at the moment. Uh, we have those discount schemes uh, and they're working and they're working well, but notwithstanding that, uh, I look forward to our meeting later today. Question number two, Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde meets its A&E waiting times target. Minister Aileen Campbell. The Scottish Government's National Unscheduled Care team has been working closely with the local teams across NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, especially the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital and the Glasgow Royal Infirmary. The team are supporting implementation of the six essential actions and the implementation of an action plan which was agreed with the Chairman of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde in December 2016 for the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. The action plan for the Queen Elizabeth focuses on priority actions that will minimise delays for patients in the A&E and immediate assessment unit including enhanced staffing for extended periods throughout the day, evenings and weekends, focus on enhanced discharges early in the day from all areas of the hospital and enhanced escalation measures introduced into patient flow meetings held three times per day. A number of these actions have been implemented so far and we've started to see results, especially in the IAU, where waiting times have been reduced by seven percentage points and the number of appropriate discharges have increased. Performances across NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde in January 2017 was 89.3 compared to Scotland at 91.8. In the year to January 2017, performance was 92.2. I recognise that more needs to be done to ensure a sustainable improvement in the performances across Greater Glasgow and Clyde, including the Queen Elizabeth. My officials uh, meet regularly with the Chairman and his uh, senior management team and continue to support progress against the action plans. Annie Wells. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Queen Elizabeth has been, the, has been the lowest 13 times out of 20 in the past, th past 20 weeks. 
Despite the Scottish Government's target of 95% of patients to be seen within four hours of arriving at a hospital, the Queen Elizabeth had the lowest compliance of any individual site, with 81.7% of patients being seen in the required time. This target has not been met for a single week since last September last year. What will the Minister do to improve access to emergency care in Glasgow? Minister. As I've already said, there has been a number of actions taken forward. The government officials continue to meet regularly with the chairman. Uh, we're working closely with the local team to support prompt recovery and sustainable, uh, support sustainable improvements in A&E and the IAU. And the support team is made up of people with clinical improvement expertise. And that's led by the Queen Elizabeth Clinical Director for Medicine and supported by the National Unscheduled Care Team. We are beginning to see improvements. We concede that more is needing to be done. That's why uh, our government officials are working very hard uh, and very closely with uh, professionals at the Queen Elizabeth. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary please advise the Chamber how many a &E consultants were employed by NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde in 2007, how many are in post now, and what the impact of this has been on patient care? Minister. Um, in September 2007, there were 25 full-time equivalent consultants specialising in emergency medicine within a NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. And to uh, inform the member, in December 2016, there were 75 uh, whole-time equivalent consultants specialising in emergency medicine within the NHS Greater in Glasgow and Clyde. That's an increase of 50 whole-time equivalents, or 200%, under this SNP government. Question number three, John Lamont. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether, whether it will provide an update on what it is doing to support sustainable rural bus services. Minister Hamza Youssef. The Scottish Government will provide bus subsidy of £53.5 million a year in 1718. The subsidy of the bus service operators grant uh, BSOG is paid directly to operators whose aim is to support overall the overall bus network and help passengers with the cost of fares. In 2012, the basis of BSOG was changed to payments made on the distance run by vehicles, which particularly benefits rural areas where bus services are longer. We've maintained the base rate of BSOG at 14.4 pence per kilometre, showing our commitment to the Scottish network, and in particular in rural areas. In addition to this, local authorities are funded through the block grant to subsidise bus services that they deem socially necessary. In years 15-16, that the spend on this was £59 million. John Lamond. I thank the Minister for that response. The Minister will be aware of the recent takeover of First Group's Borders operations by Borders Buses Limited. Whilst it's encouraging to hear that some services are being expanded, the long-term future of some other lifeline bus routes in the borders is still unclear. With council budgets being cut across Scotland, local authority subsidies are being withdrawn, meaning some rural routes are simply no longer commercially viable. In light of the comments by First Group that the impact of the Borders Railway was the main reason for their decision to withdraw, is the Minister confident enough work has been done to understand the impact of the new rail line on rural bus routes? Minister. I think to say, of course, the Borders Railway is a great success, uh, and I think people across the chambers recognise uh, that success. I spoke to Colin Craig uh, of West Coast Motors, and he'd, by the way, uh, he'd be very keen and, and happy to, to talk to the member. Uh, as well, and he gave some very uh, key reassurances. First of all, that jobs would be protected, and I think that's important for the local economy. Uh, the second uh, reassurance he gave was around service continuity. Uh, he said, uh, of course, they took over on Sunday morning, uh, and services haven't been impacted, haven't been affected, have been running smoothly uh, since then. Of course, it will be up for the private company, the commercial company, to look at its long-term uh, service uh, provision uh, in that area. But Colin Craig gave a very strong reassurance that the first thing they'll be doing is looking at making efficiencies within the company. Uh, structurally, how can they make those efficiencies as opposed to tweaking uh, or indeed withdrawing uh, certain routes? Uh, so I would say to him that the government is providing through the block grant uh, money there available for local authorities uh, to be able to subsidise, uh, as he describes it, socially necessary services. On top of that, uh, I would encourage him to speak to Colin Craig at West Coast Motors, uh, who are making a, a, an investment of £3 million in 30 new buses uh, within that fleet for the borders. Uh, I certainly got reassurances. Uh, I'm sure he would get those reassurances too. Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Notwithstanding the scaremongering by John Lamont about borders buses, and I take it he doesn't want the railway to be extended through his constituency, I, my constituents are generally impressed and cautiously optimistic about the takeover by West Coast Motors under the livery borders buses. 
I met Colin Craig recently, like the minister, I was very impressed by him. I would ask the minister if he could arrange, it would be happy to have a meeting with myself and Colin Craig to discuss the future for the bus services throughout the borders and Midlothian, and also, as he did with me, welcome the success of the Borders Railway. Minister. After her put down of John Lamont, I'll be happy to do whatever Christine Graham uh, wants me to do. So uh, I'll be more than happy uh, to have a meeting with her. Uh, and indeed Colin Craig. I am reassured. I think it is important, that, uh, in fairness to those across the chamber, and I see Rachel Hamilton here uh, as well, uh, who I think people recognise the success of the Borders Railway. She's mentioned it before. I think people across the chamber have mentioned it before. Uh, are there things that we can look at to improve uh, the Borders Railway in future years? We've committed, of course, to look at feasibilities of extensions. Uh, we will do that. Uh, but we will also, of course, uh, celebrate uh, and, and, and welcome that success, but uh, also make sure that uh, bus services uh, and provision of bus services continue, uh, particularly in our rural areas. Mike Rumbles. Um, representatives of bus companies told me just this morning that they are being discouraged from promoting the use of the free bus pass. This would be very helpful, especially for areas in rural Scotland, particularly in the northeast that I represent. Could the Minister tell me whether that's actually government policy to discourage the promotion of the free bus pass for rural bus services? And if, if it is, could he explain why? But I'd be happy to hear that it's not government policy to do that. Minister. No. Question number four, Alexander Burnett. No, uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what help it provides to nurseries in the northeast of Scotland. Minister Mark MacDonald. Uh, this government has done more than any previous administration or indeed the UK government to expand and invest in early learning and childcare. Uh, we've provided an additional £10.9 million of revenue funding to Aberdeen City Council and £14.6 million to Aberdeenshire over the period 2014-15 to 2016-17 to support expansion to 600 hours through local authority nurseries and private and third sector providers. Uh, over the same period, we've provided additional capital funding of £5.4 million to Aberdeen City Council and £8.7 million pounds to Aberdeenshire Council. Alexander Burnett. Uh, I thank the Minister for that response. Uh, four weeks ago I asked the First Minister to support a nursery facing closure due to hikes in business rates. With no help forthcoming from the Scottish Government or additional assistance provided to Aberdeenshire Council, that nursery has now closed its doors. Parents are now unable to find nursery places and are unable to return to work, including, including a newly qualified GP. So can the Minister explain how any of this news addresses the issues faced by either the nursery, people wanting to return to work in the North East, or the well-publicised shortage of GPs? Minister. Well, let, let's just deal with the facts in relation to Bridges Nursery, shall we, presiding officer. So Bridges Nursery operates two facilities in West Hill in Mr Burnett's constituency, the one in Lawsondale Avenue and the one in Arn Hill, uh, Arn Hall, sorry. Um, the Law nursery at Lawsondale Avenue is the one which is closing. It provides no funded places funded through Scottish Government or local authority funding. However, uh, council officials have advised that the company's Arn Hall Nursery will continue to be open and all of the children attending Lawsondale Avenue Nursery will be offered a space at the company's Arn Hall Nursery premises. So perhaps Mr Burnett might like to check his facts on that. And while he's checking his facts on that, he might want to reflect on the fact that the £660 million of business rates relief that this government has invested was voted against by him in this chamber, and the local business rates relief being put in place by Aberdeenshire Council was voted against by his Tory colleagues in Aberdeenshire. So perhaps before he comes to this chamber and tries to spin a yarn, he should check his facts first. Question number five, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government what upgrades are planned for the A75. Minister Hamza Youssef. Since 2008, the Scottish Government has invested over 50 million in six road improvement projects along the A75. Uh, as set out in the programme for government, the forthcoming review of the Strategic Transport Projects Review will assess recommendations for strategic transport infrastructure priorities in Dumfries and Galloway, including the A75 corridor and the rest of Scotland. Uh, as the member knows, I recently visited, visited Springholm and Crockettford, where I held positive discussions with residents and businesses on further traffic management measures. Finley Carson. Uh, thank the Minister for that uh, response. So I'd also like to thank the Minister on record for taking the time last week to come to Springholm and Crockettford in my constituency to hear firsthand the concerns of the residents who face the daily nightmare of huge numbers of lorries travelling to and for from the ferry port in Cairn Ryan. I welcome the commitments made by the Minister to improve traffic calming measures in A75, 
However, having now visited the route to recognise that action must be taken, I am sure that he will see for himself that traffic calming is simply not enough to solve the problem. Given that the draft National Transport Strategy Review isn't expected until next year, with the strategic transport projects unlikely to follow until sometime in 2019, can the Minister recognise the immediacy of the problem and commit to an accelerated, pro uh, accelerated process to bring the desperately needed bypasses for Spring Home and Crockett Ford? I'd also ask the Minister to explore how the Government can mitigate the huge burden of road upgrade costs to rural businesses adjacent to the A75 when seeking plan of permission to expand. Minister. Uh, there's clearly, uh, when I met with the, some of the residents, some of the businesses, there was mixed views. Uh, some of the businesses, like one or two of the shops, said that a bypass, of course, would take traffic away from their local shop and they wouldn't be in favour. Bearing in mind, of course, some residents very much uh, in favour of that, and I think we have to say at the moment, uh, that is a long-term ambition, uh, as he rightly says. We have a process that we go through, uh, the National Transport Strategy, Strategic Projects uh, Review as well. For the time being, though, the reverse discrimination lights that we're looking to bring in at Springholm, plus some of the measures that we said we'll explore at Crockford, I've said that we'll look to bring them forward as quickly as we possibly can. I hope that will give the members some reassurances. And let me just say, uh, you know, we had a good Dumfries and Galloway Transport Summit organised, of course, and called for by my colleague here, Joan McAlpine, uh, where we have ongoing actions, uh, of course, which the, the member and the public uh, can keep on top of and see the progress on. Joan McAlpine. Uh, thank you very much. Does the government agree with me that it's vitally important that appropriate projects for the A75 and other roads are identified locally and put forward for the STPR for consideration? And furthermore, does he acknowledge that prioritising the stretch of the A75 between Dumfries and Gretna would bring about the greatest economic benefit to the area? Minister. Just briefly, I think the member makes a very good point. And what I would say to her, and thank her again for, for calling for that summit, which the Deputy First Minister Chair and I attended, uh, that we're open-minded to suggestions that will come forward in the STPR uh, review. Uh, in terms of that uh, uh, stretch of road that she talks about, uh, I can confirm that that will be given consideration uh, when we do do the review of the STPR. <coughs> Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. On the issues of, of projects being brought forward for the A75, the, the Minister will be aware that in 2009, when the local transport agency, West Trans, undertook a stag appraisal of possible road improvements in Dumfries and Galloway, one option assessed was dual in the A75 between Gretna and Dumfries, but this option was deemed at the time not to be cost effective due to the criteria used in such assessment. Does the Minister recognise, therefore, the need to review that criteria to ensure that the significant economic benefits to Dumfries and Galloway of dual in the A75 are properly recognised? An issue, of course, which is raised at the Transport Summit the Minister refers to. Minister. I don't think it's necessary to, to review the criteria, though I'm more than happy to listen to his suggestions. Uh, otherwise, I think you know, that he would understand that there are competing priorities across the country. Whenever I travel across the country, people would like to see, understandably so, improvements to their local area, to their local constituencies. And we're always looking to be as accommodating as we possibly can. But all of that has to be within the financial constraints that we're under. Uh, but of course, if he has specific suggestions that he'd like me to look at again, within the STPR refresh, uh, I'm open-minded to doing so. Question number six, Kate Forbes. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports residential care for older people in rural areas. Minister Aileen Campbell. This Government has integrated our health and social care services, one of the most significant reforms since the establishment of the NHS, allowing health and social care partnerships to make decisions which are right for their local communities, including those who live in a rural area. We have taken actions to protect our social care services and deliver on our shared priorities. In the coming year, there will be almost half a billion pounds of NHS investment in social care and integration. Part of this investment will support the continued delivery of the living wage for care workers, supporting adults and sustainability within the sector. The formula used in the distribution of the government's funding to local authorities takes into account a number of needs-based factors, including rurality and additional cost of providing services to island communities. The Scottish Government will continue to work with NHS boards, local authorities and other stakeholders to drive up quality in all our communities and ensure appropriate social care provision is available. Kate Forbes. Thank you. The Minister will be aware of news that the Haven Care Home in Uig Sky has announced its closing in a matter of weeks, which is clearly a matter of concern to current residents and relatives. Could the Minister assure me that the Scottish Government will provide what support it can to ensure that there is continuity of care for residents? 
Minister. Uh, yes, uh, as with all care home closures, the safety and well-being of re residents is paramount and we absolutely recognise the concern expressed by Kate Forbes on this issue. And we have discussed this matter with the NHS Highlands who are working in partnership with the provider and families to seek alternative provision for the current residents and will provide whatever support to local agencies that we can to help them address this issue. In all cases where a closure occurs, the care inspectorate will work closely with the provider, residents and individual health and social care partnerships concerned to ensure that the health and well-being of every resident is assured and that any changes required are implemented with, it, with minimal disruption. And again, though, eh, I am happy to meet with Kate Forbes to provide further reassurance eh, should she wish that eh, to be eh, undertaken. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes general questions. And before we turn to our next item of business, I'm sure members would like to join me in welcoming to our gallery His Excellency Mr Arkady Szygotsky, Ambassador of the Republic of Poland to the United Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs>